Welcome to another podcast of stories and innovations in ALS with Lisa Deegan and I'm McFinn LeVere at everythingals.org. Welcome to Stories and Innovation in ALS, episode number 13, Fashionably Fighting ALS. My name is Lisa Deegan. I'm joined today with McFinn LeVere. We're storytellers who have both been affected by ALS, and our mission is to share the stories of those affected by ALS also, and the efforts of those who are investigating and innovating to find a cure for this devastating disease. We're part of an organization called Everything ALS, whose mission is care to cure with the ultimate goal of accelerating treatments for ALS. So today we are so excited to have the opportunity to talk with Dr. Richard Bedlack. He is a renowned expert on ALS and currently a professor of neurology at Duke University and director of the ALS Duke ALS Clinic. In his 22, could be more, correct me if I'm wrong, years of experience, he's seen over 3,000 patients living with ALS, and he's very well known for creating the Duke ALS Clinic in 2001, publishing over 130 ALS articles, receiving many grants and awards, participating in ALS trials, leading the ALS Untangled program, which investigates off-label treatments, and leading the ALS Reversals program, which studies why some recover and how to make this happen more often. He also is a co-founder of the ALS Clinical Research Learning Institute, training people how to be research research ambassadors for ALS. And I did the training in 219. It was awesome. So thank you for being here today, Dr. Bedlack. It's my pleasure, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dr. Bedlack. We want to start off with how did ALS touch your life and where did it begin? Yeah, so McFinn, I, I think I'm one of these people that was kind of born to be a neurologist. So one of my earliest memories is wrestling with my little brother and and rolling him down this hill in our backyard and watching him get up and kind of stagger around and wondering what that was and then rolling myself down the hill and experiencing that spinning sensation, which I later learned was vertigo and finally learned you know exactly why that happened. But I can remember all through my childhood and even into my teenage years, you know, being out in public and asking my mom. Why does that person walk like that? Why does that person's arm shake like that? And of course, there were no medical people in my family. We didn't have the internet. Uh, We didn't have cell phones. We could just Google things. So she said, you know, put it on your list and I'll drop you off at the library on Saturday and you can try to figure it out. And it was always that curiosity behind what was making people look the way they did, what was making people act the way they did trying to understand it, try to figure out maybe how it could be fixed that drove me ultimately to a career in neurology. And it was in the late 90s while I was still a resident at Duke that I saw my first patient living with ALS. And I thought of all the things I'd seen up to that point in my life, it was the most amazing and most terrible thing. Um, There is no story, there is no collection of exam findings like that of a person with ALS. And I remember how bad I felt when the attending that I was working under said, we don't really know why this happens and there's really nothing we can do about it. That person is just gonna have to go home and get their affairs in order. And I think, you know, driving home that day, I I said to myself, this is the disease that I wanna devote my career to. And there's gotta be a better way to do it than I just saw. Well, we are so glad you are here and doing that. Um, And that story is all too familiar to me because my brother had ALS and they basically told him, you know, go home and get your affairs in order and make yourself comfortable. So um, I can very much relate to that. But um, we'd love to know um, what makes you stand out to your patients? Obviously, you have a fun sense of style and I would like you to share with us. I'm, I'm sure there's meaning behind that. And b- before you answer this, I want to share some adjectives and phrases that patients use to describe you. <laughs> Knowledgeable, caring, compassionate, kind, wonderful, excellent, fun, impressive, courteous, works tirelessly, patient-centered, incredible team, pleasant experience, truly cares. Mm-hmm. I feel at home. And to sum it up, bedlock rocks. <laughs> right on. Well, Lisa, you made me nervous there when you said you were going to start reading things. I'm glad you went to the to the good websites and not, <laughs> not the bad websites. Um, well, to start off with, you know, the clothes, it's it's always been something 
since I was a kid, um, I didn't grow up in the in the greatest neighborhood. And I just recognized if I put on something really loud and fun, it's kind of like a suit of armor. Mm -hmm. Like nobody could mess up my day. I, I felt like it was protecting me. And I found that it had a disarming effect on people around me too. Instead of picking on me, you know, people would be like, hey, look at this kid with this crazy outfit. That's pretty cool. Put a smile on their faces. And so I've just carried that through and found that it's incredibly helpful in ALS. You know, there are days when I'll see 15 to 20 people with ALS in my clinic. Mm -hmm. And each person, including that very last person, needs me to be as upbeat and positive as the first person did. Mm -hmm. And the clothes help. Um, and they also make the clinic less scary. You know, we've got this huge team. Everybody on the team is measuring things. Sometimes the measurements are worse and that prompts really difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And so that can be kind of scary just walking in and knowing that that's gonna happen over the course of the day. And so, you know, if we can start off with somebody laughing about the outfit that I have on and wanting to get a selfie, well, then we're off, off to a good start, I think. But you asked, you know, what distinguishes me? I mean, I feel, you know, that there's a lot of great people who are talented in the ALS world and everybody brings something different to the table. I'm probably not nearly as smart as some of the other people um, that are working in ALS, but I do feel like I'm one of the more optimistic doctors. I do feel like I'm one of the more responsive doctors. I try my best to get back to everybody's messages and, and emails within 24 hours. And I also feel like I'm maybe one of the more open-minded doctors. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm like that is I just feel like until the day when I know how to fix this disease, why wouldn't I consider unusual approaches to it. I mean, I don't know what the right answer is. Mm -hmm. So I have to keep an open mind when someone comes in with an idea and just try to look at it like a scientist would and say, is it plausible that this could work? If so, mm -hmm. you know, what, what exactly are we going to try here as far as dosage and source of a product and how long are we going to do it for and mm -hmm. what measurements are we going to follow? But I'm perfectly willing to do those, what I call N of one experiments or self experiments with my patients until the day when I know how to fix this and everybody. Well, I actually think you're brilliant because um, to cure this, it's not, we haven't figured it out yet. So it's gonna be somebody who has to think outside of the box and, and look at other things that to help us get closer to a cure or to at least some answers because, you know, what we, and I know everybody's doing fantastic work, but I think it's gonna take, you know, a little out of the box thinking because this is so layered, as you know. You know, and it may not even all be the same thing, Lisa, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the most challenging things is that we approach our trials as if this is all the same disease, yeah. and it may not be. I mean, I always use the analogy, imagine if we had the world's greatest cream for poison ivy, but all we knew was that it was a red itchy rash. Yeah. And so we enrolled, you know, a thousand people with a red itchy rash, and we put half of them on this cream and half on placebo. We probably wouldn't see any signal. You know, because the people with the poison ivy got better, but the people with the eczema and the psoriasis and the chicken pox and the mosquito bites didn't have any effect. So, I mean, there probably are multiple different ways to get to the death of motor neurons. And, you know, until the day when we understand how to break these cases down, I would love to see everybody trying something. Ideally, you know, with some, some sort of outcome measures followed and some way to keep track of everything in a centralized database it's kind of like high throughput drug screening in people. Yeah. You know, everybody agrees that high throughput drug screening is the right thing to do in test tubes and maybe even in animal models where you pick a target or you pick a, a genetic disease that you're gonna study in animals and you just dump every known drug into this assay and see which ones work. It's a quick way to find promising drugs that you would take into human trials. Well, why not put every person with ALS on something? and track how they do. That's high throughput drug screening in people. And I think it's a much faster way to get to drugs that work, maybe even in subsets of patients than what we're doing now. When you focus on ALS, do you find that there's another disease that comes close to it that you would be helping both of those diseases? It's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I hope that whatever we learn from one neurodegenerative disease applies to another. So, you know, I hope that whatever we learn that helps people with ALS will ultimately apply to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and Huntington's and things like that. But I just don't know, McFinn. I mean, there certainly are common downstream pathways 
in all these diseases that result in the death of, of different types of cells in the brain and spinal cord. But how you get to those pathways may be quite different in these different diseases. And that's, I think that's probably where the money is in, in targeting upstream events. We just don't know what those are yet for most people. And, Thank and you. And you've, you've discussed a few of these challenges, but what would you say, if you could sum it up, like what are the biggest roadblocks or challenges that, that you are personally facing in your work? I know so I that's think a the biggest question. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. There's a lot of challenges, but I think the biggest mm -hmm. is there's just not enough resources. Okay. There's not enough people working on this. There's not enough time for those of us that are passionate about this. There's not enough money yeah. to do all the things that we want to do. Why? And Why is there not me, enough money? Yeah, I mean, it leads me, Lisa, to this uh, huge opportunity that I don't think most people are aware of, and that is endowed professorships. And okay. I'm, I'm not asking this, you know, from myself, because I'm getting, I'm getting gray, and you know, it's it's probably not going to fund much of of my own career. But it's just amazing to me that with a disease that's this difficult, that we all agree is this difficult to crack that hardly anybody anywhere in the world is working full-time on ALS. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's astonishing. Mm -hmm. Even as passionate as I am and as hard as I work, I can't work every day on ALS. And the reason is that that work is not revenue neutral for my institution. And everybody has to be revenue neutral for their institution. So on the days when I lose money working on ALS, I've got to do something else on the other days to make that up. Like for example, the other day I was rounding on patients who came in the night before with strokes. So I did that for an entire half a day. Now there's nothing wrong with that work. It's just, I would rather be working on ALS research and trying to find the cure than doing that. And the only way that we're ever gonna have people doing it is to create endowed professorships that are specific for someone working on ALS. These are pots of money off of which the interest pays the salary, offsets the losses of a person who wants to spend their career working full-time on ALS. And there's only a handful of these that I know of in the whole world. I'm trying to create one here at Duke. I'm very close to getting to the threshold. It's three and a half million at my institution and I'm at 2.8. But if I can get there, then at least I know, you know, if I don't find the cure for ALS in my lifetime, somebody at Duke will always be working on that full-time even after I'm gone. And that's really important to me. How do you think that your work so far, what, what, what's the biggest thing that you've come across that makes you feel the best? Such a, such a, a tough question. Cause I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of things that I accomplished. I mean, you know, to change the culture at an institution that's as conservative as Duke, where once upon a time people were being told there's nothing we can do. And now we have a team, we have 19 clinicians on our team. And when people come here, you know, they're going over from head to toe by this whole team. And they spend most of the day with us every few months and they leave with, with a long list of things they can do. And you know, there's, there's more opportunity for them to try experimental therapies, either in all the different clinical trials that we do or some of the expanded access programs that we host or some of the N of one experiments, the self-experimentation that I'm willing to partner with patients on. So, I mean, I, I think I'm proud of of building all that, giving people who come to my institution more opportunities. But I mean, I'm also proud of the Pinnacle Research Learning Institute. I feel like when I started, you know, the main, the main role for patients in ALS research was to be subjects. That's what they were called, subjects. Mm -hmm. This is what we're asking you to do. You either do it or you don't. Yeah. And now I feel like, um, you know, I've, I've been part of this patient empowerment where people are more engaged. They're having a much greater role in research than ever before. They understand research better. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're getting an opportunity to um, influence protocol design, mm -hmm. to help spread the word, to help fund more studies, to change laws, to promote more research, to get more expanded access opportunities, to talk to policymakers like the FDA so they understand the patient mm -hmm. perspective. And that's been awesome to see, to see people go from, from subjects to like the major players. I feel like patients have become the major force behind what ALS research looks like now. That's, that's a paradigm shift, and I'm glad I got to see it. I'm glad you got to see it too, because I really felt like I was out of the loop with my neurologist when they told me that I had ALS and you come and see me every three months. 
it was it was an empty shell that they were offering me and thank god um i looked around and and got some other opinions and my naturopath uh stepped in and said let's just investigate further so yeah. investigation rick it's the um it's the goal we need to investigate because we haven't found the answer in all these years so dr bedlock who's been your champion throughout this oh my like gosh. Who, who do you lean on who do you look look up to yeah i mean so i would have to say my wife is my biggest champion oh. you know i uh <laughs> i spend an i spend a pretty amazing amount of time working on als it doesn't feel like work to me because um i'm, I'm still completely fascinated by this disease I'm working with, with people that amaze and inspire me, and I'm getting to work on it in very creative ways. The creativity is like a really important thing to me to be able to express that. And, and so, I mean, it's rare that my wife and I will spend any time when I'm not doing something related to ALS. And I mean, you're just not gonna find too many people that would understand that kind of commitment to, to a cause that she does. And, you know, we still have so much fun together. We can still make each other laugh just about every day, even after 33 years together. Oh, I love that. And I've that. also got an incredible team here that champions me, especially my Duke ALS clinic coordinator, Stacey Asnani. I call her Wonder Woman because I throw a lot of <laughs> things at her, things that she's never seen before. Every time I go out and give a talk and I talk about, you know, some, some new project that I have in mind that I'm going to be starting in the next year or two her phone just lights up, you know, with people that have questions or want to yeah. come here and she just takes it all in stride and manages it. Um, and then I've also got mentors. I mean, there's an incredible number of dedicated people working on ALS that I look up to. I, I personally look up to uh, Terry Hyman Patterson mm -hmm. as an amazing, amazing ALS doctor. If I always say if I ever get ALS, I'm going to move to Philadelphia and Terry's going to be my doctor. That's how much I respect her. Wow. And there's some incredible clinical scientists. I mean, Merit Chikovitz, Jinzy Andrews, Jeremy Scheffner. I think um, these are the people I look up to um, from a standpoint of, of, you know, clinical science, clinical trials, those kinds of things. Mm. Cool. Well, can we, can we jump into a reversal for a minute? Have yeah. you found anything in common with ALS reversals? Not yet, McFinn. Um, nothing definite. You know, my impression, as I've as I've told you before, is that these folks tend to be a lot, a lot more positive than in you know just in most people in general. But I don't know which came first is the problem. I'm not entirely sure how to study mm -hmm. positive attitude. I mean, you can imagine if if somebody gave you terrible news like you had ALS, mm -hmm. especially if they put it the way the way I first saw it put to a patient and McFinn the way you heard it which is there's nothing we can do about this, you were pretty low. And then instead of progressing and dying, like the doctor told you, you would, you recovered. Gosh, I bet your attitude would be fantastic after that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether the good attitude came first or was the result of the reversal. But yeah, I mean, I'm trying to study these folks in every way that I can. I'm collaborating with everyone. I know, I mean, I've got collaborations within Duke here to study the uh, radiology of these patients, the studies that they've had of their brain and spinal cord, to study the microbiome of these patients, mm -hmm. collaborations with the CREATE Consortium to study the genetics, mm -hmm. collaborations with ALS-TDI to study RNA and protein biomarkers, mm -hmm. um, collaborations with the National Registry to see if there could be something different about the environment. So, I mean, the great news is we keep finding more. We're up to 53 now. And okay. I've got another one here that I've been looking at that looks very promising. I need to get a few more pieces of records to really firm it up, but I keep finding them. And I think the more we find, the more people get interested and the more people get interested, the better the chances that we're gonna figure this out. And yes. so for clarification, these were not your patients to start with. These are people that you are studying that seem to have reversed their ALS, right? That's right. Because we That's get right. people on our webinars, we need to go to bed lack, we, we need a reversal. So you are very much, you know, reversals and, and your name go together. So um, we definitely will send people your way when they, you know, feel their symptoms have. In fact, John is um, one of our, I don't know his last name. He was your reversal number. McFinn, help me out. Harrison, John Harrison. Harrison. 
Thank He's you. He's 52. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, no, I really appreciate the referrals. And, I, and again, I mean, you know, it's I'm seeing a paradigm shift in this because when I, when I first found the handful of cases that looked like they recovered, I didn't know what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and I was talking to everyone I knew about these cases. And I think most people were very skeptical and didn't believe that these folks ever had ALS in the first yeah. place. Yeah. And it's really a question of semantics more than anything else. We don't have a test for ALS. There's yeah. no one test that comes back positive or negative. Mm -hmm. You know, the diagnosis is made, made by a certain story, certain exam findings, an EMG, and then certain tests to rule out mimics. And yeah. every one of these cases had all those things. So they had an ALS diagnosis by, by today's definition of it. Like and I think you know, the more I talk about it, the more of these cases I find, the more people become convinced that this is something worth studying, which is why I now have so many great collaborators. Well, and hopefully we'll be getting answers from you that will help lead us closer to what makes this happen and what makes it stop. Well, yeah. nobody's, day, nobody's, nobody's studying this, but you, right? I mean, is there anybody else? I, the, only, the only thing that I've seen similar is I, I know I've seen a paper published on plateaus. Okay. There was a paper that came out of Israel that was just commenting that ALS plateaus mm -hmm. occur. That's, that's where people seem to stop progressing for long periods of time. And I mean, I think that's worth studying too. Yeah. I mean, there's clearly something different about, about people who, you know, whose progression seems to stop or reverse. Um, I just don't know if those are the same as the reversals, but I'm all, I'm all for studying anybody who seems to be an outlier, especially when it's an outlier in a good way, like someone whose progression slowed, stopped, or reversed for a long period of time. I mean, we really need to understand that. Well, I, I've donated my brain and my spinal cord. I had to get my wife to like uh, put the telephone number in her wallet just in case we're away from the home because I got to be uh, cut in 12 hours. So I'm looking forward to being an answer for you, Rick. It's uh, my- Yeah, and I appreciate you doing that. That's I forgot about that collaboration with the um, NIH biorepository. They've agreed to uh, to look at autopsies on people. Hopefully, many many years from now, when they die of natural causes, but be very curious to know if the pathology in their brains and spinal cords looks different than the pathology of of someone who had more typical ALS. Well, thanks to McFinn and others who are dedicated to sharing their bodies and their their fluids and their everything with science. Once you have ALS. I mean, for me to come out of it, there's nothing more in my life that I'm more passionate about is to see somebody else come out of this, because mm -hmm. if I can do it, somebody else can do it. And so I told my wife, I said, sweetheart, this is my new passion. And she just looked at me and she said, what about me? <laughs> and I said, oh, right. Aww. Okay. 50, 50, oh, no, 70, 30. Anyway, Rick, we have to watch out for our wives. Yeah. We get so involved in this and it's so interesting that, you know, I finally told my wife that I would talk to her about politics if she would let me talk about ALS. And so we, we got an agreement. I love, I love these stories from both of you. Um, I'm so glad we got to touch on reversals because I know everybody wants to hear about that. So um, I, I don't wanna end that conversation if you guys wanna keep adding some stuff, but I, I also wanna show how far you've become or how far you have come from the Duke ALS clinic in 2001. What was your first clinical trial and what cl clinical trial are you doing currently um, to show, you know, there has been a lot of movement forward in ALS and it, it is a more promising time now. So love you to share some of that with us. Yeah, I mean, no question. So for the first several years of me running the Duke ALS clinic, we didn't have any, any research. Mm -hmm. And that's because nobody knew who I was. Um, I, I didn't really have an ALS mentor. There, again, there was nobody here that was interested in it. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of go out there and find you know, the top ALS people, go visit their clinics, go up to them at meetings and harass them. You know, Remember me? Hey, you got any research that we can get involved with? Yeah. Um, and then we also had to grow a critical mass of patients. I mean, you can't really be a site for a study if you only have four patients, which is about what we started with. Wow. Um, so 
it was probably, I'm going to say um, 2006, maybe, mm -hmm. when we got our first research study. And that was we got invited to be in a multi-center trial of creatine mm -hmm. for ALS. And we did a good job enrolling. We were one of the highest enrolling sites. We had no problems mm -hmm. with conducting the trial. There were no protocol deviations or anything like that that got us in trouble. And so we started to get invited to participate in more multi-center trials. And as we grew to where we are now, which is we follow about 450 patients, we started to get um, a lot of interest from patients in growing our own research. So we still do research for other people, yeah. but we've also got our own homegrown research program too, which is all patient funded. And so we, we currently have four different clinical trials enrolling, one expanded access program, ALS Untangled, all those ALS reversals studies, a microbiome study, and a sample bank study. So it's a lot going on for um, you know two part-time attendings and two part-time research coordinators. It, it's you? amazing what you've done. And we are going to be having you talk on the Everything ALS webinar on your clenbuterol trial findings. So we're, yes. we're looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm looking taking any, too. it's pretty exciting. Are, are you taking any new patients on, Rick? Absolutely. We're still taking new patients. I mean, unfortunately, we do, like a lot of ALS clinics, we do have a wait. Um, so even, even at the pace that we're working at, which is we see four to five new patients every week, we probably have about 70 patients on a waiting list. So you do the math. Unfortunately, it's several months out for our next new patient slot. But if you added all those patients together, how many patients is, is Duke seeing? So every year we see about 250 new patients mm -hmm. with ALS and we follow about 450. And I mean, we could, we could see even more if we had more time to dedicate to this disease. So again, I think that'll be one of the benefits if the endowed professorship comes through that I would be able to see more patients than I'm seeing now. Given that you've seen so many patients and you've been through a lot of journeys with people, and I've heard of several of them, like the I think Tommy was his name. I remember hearing about that. He was the younger guy. How, how do you navigate emotionally? I'm guessing you lean on your wife a lot, but I think it could be a real hard thing. You get attached to people and you, 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 know, you wanna help and it's tough. It's a tough journey. So how do, you, how do you stay so positive and provide people with so much hope? Yeah. You know, share. Thank yeah. you for asking that question. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a human being, I'm not a machine. Yeah. And it does take a toll. You know, I, there's so many difficult conversations that are part of taking care of people with this disease from breaking the news to conversations about giving up something that you enjoy like driving to conversations about wheelchairs and feeding tubes and ventilators and, you know, end of life decision-making. Mm -hmm. I, I equate each one of these conversations to being punched in the stomach really hard. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like to me. Yeah. And I tell, I tell the young doctors, if it ever gets to where it doesn't feel like that, then you, you probably need to get out because you've lost your empathy. It should yeah. feel bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. I always remember the way one of my patients described the disease to me. She said, you know, ever since you told me that I had this, it's like you put me in a box mm -hmm. and the box gets a little smaller on all sides every day, further restricting what I can do. Mm -hmm. And eventually it's going to get so small that it's going to just crush the wind right out of me. Yeah. And, you know, my glasses are fogging up because I still, I still tear up when I hear that and, and just think to myself, I can't stop it. I mean, I'm trying everything I can think of, but I still can't yeah. stop it. Yeah. And there's Dr. days when, when I leave here and I'm in tears on the way home and I think to myself, I don't know if I'm going back tomorrow, mm -hmm. but it's amazing. I, I do believe in a higher power and it seems like, mm -hmm. Whenever I'm at my lowest point, I get a sign. You know, it might be a call, <laughs> might be an email from mm -hmm. a patient or a family member, mm -hmm. or even a colleague appreciating their, uh, mm -hmm. you know, expressing their appreciation for, mm -hmm. for what I've done. Um, or it might be a new grant or a paper. Mm -hmm. And it's these little things to me that tell me I'm, I'm on the right path and I need to keep trying. And I've already mentioned, I mean, I've got so many blessings in my life, my wife, mm -hmm. I got two great cats that give me unconditional love. I got a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. I got this amazing team that I love working with. Um, and I got these crazy clothes that <laughs> just a little thing, but and no, you know, it's, sometimes it's just a, looking down at the dragon on my sleeve makes me smile yeah. and picks me up a little bit. 
Well, I have to say doctors like you and the wonderful people that are out there that are fighting are what keep me personally motivated because my brother is gone and there's nothing I can do about that. And sometimes I just, I don't want to talk about ALS. I don't want to hear those three letters because they, they did not, they added a lot of grief in my life, but um, people like you keep me motivated and keep me keep me still interested and want to keep joining in on the fight because I see how hard you guys work. And I'm like, you know what, that, that inspires me to want to do even better. So thank you. That's, that's very kind. I mean, you inspire me as well. It's very, it's gotta be very easy when this disease hammers someone you love, you know, when that battle is over to just get away from it and try to forget about it. And mm -hmm. People like you that roll up their sleeves and stay involved are, are very motivating to me as well. Oh, thanks. Rick, when I was in my wheelchair uh, every day, all day long, uh, I used to smoke a lot of cannabis and uh, it really calmed me down because of the fear of what I thought was coming to get me. Is there any other um, medicines that would help that, that you could suggest? This is a very scary thing when, when you realize what's coming to get you. Mm -hmm. Cannabis was my go-to. Uh, Lexapro was something that I just put aside. Um, is there anything that you recommend for people with depression? Yeah, I mean, so, so McFinn, what I usually do is I usually encourage people to talk about it with me or with somebody that they care about and trust, talk about their feelings but also to try to remind yourself that even though our, there are things happening that you cannot control, there are a lot of things that you can control. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of amazing to me how just that is enough to uh, empower people to do amazing things with mm -hmm. this disease. Like I'll tell you a story. I remember um, one of my patients calling me a few years ago to go on the radio with her. She said, the station wants to interview me about my ALS and I, I want you to be there in case they ask me anything scientific. And this is someone that I had this conversation with that was very scared in the beginning, very angry in the beginning. People grieve in such different ways. Yeah. But I remember I was sitting behind her and they were asking her questions, you know, tell us what your life was like the first day you saw Dr. Bedlack. And she said, I, I thought I had it made. I was vice president of this big international company. I was traveling all over the world, making lots of money. I thought I was going to be president probably in the next five years. I was just on top of the world. Mm -hmm. And the DJ said, well, what about, what about the rest of your life? And she said, well, my family life wasn't that great. My husband and I were separated and mm -hmm. we have kids, but you know, we really, we didn't spend a lot of time together mm -hmm. when we were together, everybody was on their devices. And, and they said, are you spiritual? And she said, I used to be, I used to really be involved with the church, but that's, that's kind of all gone. I haven't been to church in, in many years. And he said, what were you like physically? And she said, all I had was a foot drop. And I couldn't believe Bedlack was telling me this is this was my disease and you know explaining to me that this is what usually happens to people with this disease. I was furious that he messed up my life like that and angry and terrified and you know we had the conversation and she just completely switched what she was focused on. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, "So now, you know, it's 5 years after your diagnosis and you're in a wheelchair and I can see you can't move your hands very well." So you're physically much worse. What about the rest of your life? She said, mm -hmm. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. she said, my husband and I are back together. We're more in love than we've ever been. Oh. We spend time with the kids. You know, we're involved in their lives. I've reconnected with my faith. I'm doing mission work for the church. You know, it's virtual work, but it's still you know very fulfilling. And she said, you know, my life has become so much better since my ALS diagnosis that if Bedlack had a pill that would take this disease away but make my life the way it used to be, I wouldn't take it. Wow. And I just like, I just grabbed my chest. I, I love like, hearing you that. Talk about, you talk about the ultimate uh, example of, of just kind of refocusing and, and making lemonade out of a lemon. Well, what I learned from ALS, and I want to hear what you learned. I learned that be thankful for what you do have. I saw my brother be robbed of basically everything but moving his eyes literally. Yeah. Um, but he found joy in smoking pot, having caregivers around him that he liked, and they would, you know, feed him little Moscow mules. I, you know, I learned just find joy in what you can, what you have control over, because yeah. that's all you can do at the end of the day. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we're talking about the same thing. I mean, if I had to pick one most important thing, I've learned so much, but if I had to pick one most important thing I learned, you know, early in my career, I was so focused on the science of ALS, you know, reading about the different types of therapists that I should have and the different measurements that we should make and the different evidence and experience-based treatments that we should offer based on these measurements. Mm -hmm. And then I met that guy, Tim, that you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he's 25 years old. Mm -hmm. I walked in the room and I, I was astounded by this huge collection of characters with mohawks and piercings <laughs> and just the craziest, even crazier clothes than me. And uh, they all had tattoos. And uh, they, as I looked around, they were all wearing at least one swallow tattoo. Tim had a whole sleeve of them and everybody in the room had at least one of these swallows. Mm. So after we finished the whole conversation, I said, I gotta ask, you know, uh, what's with the swallow tattoos? And he said, well, as, as, you, to as you know, we, we talked about my family, you know, this gene runs in our family. My mom died from ALS when I was real little. I didn't really know her, but she left me this book and in every page of the book, she had drawn one swallow. And I don't know why, but when I got old enough to get a tattoo, I got every swallow from the book on my arm to remember my mom. Mm -hmm. And then when I started getting sick, everybody got one of these swallows off my arm somewhere on their body mm -hmm. to show that we're like this united army. We call ourselves the often awesome army. Mm -hmm. We're gonna keep this positive no matter what happens. We're gonna keep it upbeat, hopeful and positive. And they did. They came as an army. They always had these funny stories to tell me, these crazy videos that they were putting on YouTube about Tim's life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just all kinds of great questions about hopeful research. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was so amazed by what, what this meant to them mm -hmm. that I decided to get one of those tattoos. I have just one tattoo. Oh. It's a little black swallow from Tim's arm. And uh, before I got it, I checked to see if it had some hidden meaning that might get me fired. It turns out it's a, it's a symbol that sailors used to get on their arms because swallows are the first bird you see when land is approaching. Oh. So for them, it meant that they weren't lost at sea. So I thought, oh. you know, what a great symbol for, for Tim's fight and for ALS. And I got it right there because the last thing I usually do is sign something for the patient, the chart or a prescription, and it pops out of my sleeve. Yeah. And it reminds me like, no matter how many numbers went through my head, how many options I offered and explained, the most important thing I have to make sure I do for every patient is say something hopeful every time. Mm. Thank you, you Dr. Bedlack. We want to ask you one last thing. What can we do for you? You got a minute? Tell you got a minute and a half. What can we what do, can for, we do you? for you? You know, you've done so much for me already. Uh, you, you always host me as a speaker and let me talk about all my wild and crazy projects, which I appreciate you know, keep spreading the word about ALS reversals. I definitely want to hear about people who think they're recovering from ALS. Mm -hmm. And then I would just, I would encourage you to spread the word about this, this unknown problem that I think is one of the biggest yeah, problems yeah. we have that's slowing our search for the cure. Mm -hmm. The fact that most of us can't focus full time. And I mean, there may be other ways to address this, but okay. the solution I'm working on is an endowed professorship. And I really do feel like if we had endowed professorships at all the major institutions around the world, we would find a cure for ALS much faster. We would have the most passionate, talented people working full-time on this disease, and that's what we need. All right. Well, anytime you want to come on Everything ALS podcast or webinar to talk about any of this stuff, you are always welcome. You are one of our favorites, so anytime. Oh, I so appreciate that. I really love what you're doing, too, so keep up your good work. All right. Thanks Thank so you much. so much for your time, Dr. Bedlack. Yes, and we'll be in you. touch. You're a rock All right, star. Have a good weekend. You All too. Right. Thank Thanks. you so much. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us in our journey of exploration and digging deep into the souls of those affected by ALS and those working tirelessly to help put an end to this devastating disease. Your stories and work matter so much to us and to so many. Keep sharing and continuing to help further the research in ALS so we don't have to see another person suffer. Do you know anyone suffering from ALS? Are you a researcher, neurologist, pharma, or biotech company working in the ALS space? If so, 
we would love to hear from you. Contact us at info at everythingals.org. Thank you, folks. 